All right, welcome everybody to today's Cybra RFID webinar. The topic for today is Ready for Liftoff, How to Scale an RFID Project from Pilot to Production. My name is Phil Andrianos. I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist here at Cybra. And we're going to wait a few more moments to let um, any other late attendees come in. Um, just a few ground rules just to get started. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have done these webinars before and use GoToWebinar, but um, as you know, you're going to be uh, muted throughout the webinar, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, interact with us. In fact, we highly encourage it. Um, how you do that is at the bottom, towards the bottom right of the GoToWebinar, you can uh, chat to us and I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, and uh, as the webinar goes along, we'll try to answer your questions um, if we can't get to the question, we'll uh, answer it towards the end. And if we can't, uh, if we don't have enough time at the end, we'll uh, one of our presenters will try and get a hold of you uh, via email or via phone and get everything sorted out. Um, so uh, this is a uh, informational webinar, so be sure to take lots of notes and uh, be real attentive. Of course, uh, ask plenty of questions. Um, and if you have any further questions, you can email us at info at cyber.com. Um, it's after 2 o'clock, so I think we might be able to get started. Um, our presenters today are Mike Shabet, the VP of Sales and Marketing here at Cyber, and also uh, the Chief, Chief Solutions Architect, Sheldon Reich. Um, are you guys just about ready to get started? Yes, I Phil. I think so. Thank you, Phil. All right, Thank great. You. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, our agenda today is really very simple. Uh, we want to uh, give you some concrete steps and a concrete uh, roadmap, for lack of a better term, to scale a project or even a pilot or a concept even and get it into full production. And uh, the agenda, we'll go over these in, in, in detail. Um, there's a, intro, a little introductory piece why you are the most important, but if not you, somebody in your, in your organization is the most important person. And then we'll go into the detailed steps about the, uh, about the plan. So without further ado, let's go to the uh, first slide. <laughs> you know this one? We've shown it before. Real simple. If you're doing barcode scanning now, you're reading one item at a time. RFID allows you to read hundreds of items at once. Very simple. And that, so all the change that you make are to improve the processes where you're single threaded and make them multi threaded processes. So, who is your RFID champion? And uh, I mean, I'd like to say it's basically the person in your organization who lack of a better term, who has a project ownership at management level. It's essential that whoever becomes your RFID champion in your organization has the complete backing of management up to the CEO, the CIO, the CFO, everybody. Okay? Because it's the RFID champion has to push the project through milestones, must have authority to create a cross-functional team with representation from various departments manufacturing, operations, packaging, warehouse management, security, IT, et cetera, and so forth. And we have seen installations stretch out and cost spiral because of the lack of ownership of the product. Um, it's, the, it's the champion, the RFID champion, who's responsible to ensure that team members are needed, are available as needed, and there are dedicated technical and uh, other kind of resources on site uh, for the duration of the implementation to ensure project success. And um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, so we're, we would be an outside vendor. We show up to, to do some installation in your facility. And as is the case in many facilities, it's a union shop. Okay? Well, we would not be allowed to install or go up on an X, you know, on an X jack unless uh, arrangements have been made, and uh, let's say a union member goes up with us, whatever. But the point is that this is a typical uh, uh, type of example where the, the project would just stop because we don't have the resources uh, to continue uh, our, uh, on an installation. Uh, another kind of example is that if, if, the, if the RFID champion doesn't take ownership, then um, 
you can't refine the, the RFID uh, project as you go along. You're going to be getting results. What are the results worth? What, you know, how, what the, what's the data quality? All that stuff is, is lost. You're, you know your business, and you, you know, need to be able to go into the systems, at least the systems the way we provide. We provide where you don't need to constantly go grab an IT guy to make changes. We show you how to um, change settings, et cetera. And you should be, you know, the RFID champion is the one that says, hey, yeah, we can go in, change the power here, change the recession here, various, for whatever those kind of changes are for refinements, for lack of a better term, that are needed, uh, somebody's got to take ownership. And that's really the key. Michael, you have anything to add to that? Well, yes, yeah, Shell, and just kind of round that out a little bit. The Edge Magic software is unique in the fact that it uh, is user configura configurable and user scalable. So typically in implementation, your RFID champion in the organization would have to have some uh, input with the IT department to access the server and network uh, connections. The scheduling and shipping, being able to install RFID infrastructure, fixed portals, antennas, uh, maybe need to be done off hours or scheduled in in between either receiving process or a shipping process so that the installers can get the infrastructure in place without dodging forklift trucks and uh, moving pallets and uh, impacting some of that uh, some of that movement that's going on uh, where you've got two objectives happening in the same place at the same time so as Sheldon said typically uh, an RFID champion is so important in being able to coordinate all of the cross-functional teams so as the implementation affects each of those uh, objectives uh, everyone's on board and the uh, uh, the time is scheduled to uh, have a successful implementation of those various milestones thank you uh, Bill, I see a, uh, a question coming aboard um, there's a message uh, yes. Um, actually, I think that was. You can keep going. It. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, that was a private message. Okay. There's a. What the other message that I that I received here is: this, Does it have to have any title? The RFID champion. And the truth is, the RFID champion can be a anybody in your organization: a project leader, a manager, a director. A, you know, all the way up to the to the CIO, even to the CEO. The point is, is that that person has to have that access and that ability to rein in those resources and and bring them on, you know, as needed to uh, basically marshal the project through. Well, obviously, you're going to need an RFID plan, and so what? What's the plan? What does it look like? Where do you begin? And you know, the way that there's, there's a, it is cl closer to rocket science than barcoding, but the truth is you shouldn't have to twist yourself into a pretzel, or as those of us who are of a certain age, remember a gentleman named Rube Goldberg who had designed these elaborate contraptions to be able to uh, um, do a certain uh, function. The idea is that with a plan in place, you won't have a Rube Goldbergian contraption to um, you know, to to use the power of RFID internally. Excuse me. Okay. So what is the plan? Okay. There's, there's five. Uh, we break it out into five steps. Five steps are actually really ten components. There's research and scope, survey and document, test and analyze, pilot and refine and rollout and production, and by Following these exact steps as they come out, you're able to have a, a little a Rube Goldbergian contraption that actually you know works in sync, um, as, as the little illustration shows. But the next slide is important because let's think of some of the areas that you might be trying to use RFID to improve your business. Okay. You want to improve. Maybe it's reduced chargebacks. Maybe it's 
improve your uh, your inventory, the visibility, product availability, optimize your fulfillment. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are um, selling to your retail partners. You probably also have to do some e-commerce fulfillment. Two completely different, uh, um, you know, shipping and, and, and picking and packing um, paradigms. Okay, one's B to B, one's B to C. Um, maybe you want to put your, get better results out of your out of your staff, for better utilization. And uh, one of the things that all the way from the retail all the way back into the factories, we've seen this across the board, and that is that, that everybody wants to eliminate concealed shortages. They want to you know minimize or or eliminate if possible uh, losses. So whether it's an inside job or just a mistake, the point is is that these are some of the these are the you know main areas that RFID will enable some improvements across the board. Um, so then, what what what's that next step? The next step is basically you got to research. What are you trying to accomplish? What pick a pick an application area. How will it help your business? It's a particular thing, and it helps to just speak to your customers, speak to your friendly competitors, go to conferences like GS1 Connect, RFID Journal Live, or if you're on a particular industry group, sit in on a round table. Just call it. Yeah, you know what? You can call your competitors. Find out what your competitors are doing. So, you know, I, I'm, I know that there are lots of um, opportunities to... Uh, to meet and mingle with them, and uh, find out what what are they doing. Okay, if you're uh, replying or uh, complying with a mandate from a retail partner, oh, that they're going to tell you what to do or what's needed. Okay, so that you know, just start putting it all together you know, to 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 get those um, um, get some of those targets, for lack of a better term. Uh, now, this is kind of early on, and it may seem to you to be a little premature. We can tell you right from the get-go, this is one of the most important things to do way before you even start talking equipment or anything. And that is to find a statement of work. The statement of work is what, where are the software in your systems, what are the touch points that will need to be addressed? Because you may have to marshal some additional resources, meaning that uh, internal uh, IT resources or even your application software vendor resources if there's going to be an, any integration. But even without integration, what, which, um, you know, which processes in the, in the application, which modules are going to be impacted? I'll just give you a, a simple example. And that is, I will bet 99% of you, if not 100%, have application software that um, has uh, or, you know, on a record for a stock keeping unit for, for an SKU, it's got, let's say the item is uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it'll say quantity 24, 45, 105,000, right? But it does not have places inside your, in, that, in the database for uh, you know, item 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, serial number, you know, billion and one, next serial number billion and two, Next serial number billion, billion and three. Okay, such that the systems were not designed that way, and they just don't have the. It's just not in there. Our software happens to be designed that way. That's what it's for. But the idea being is that we the think of the touch point and uh, and the requirement is okay. Have the RFID system give me back summary data. What what the RFID system is doing is validating. It's it's doing certain processes that you're doing, enhancing those processes, and then. You can uh, share through API or however reason, however way you choose to do it, um, the summary data. What was the result? Okay. And last on this research and scope side, meet with the vendors. There's lots of us out there, but most important, look for this the scar tissue. You'll notice us. We've got you know band aids and and uh, ace bandages because we've all we've learned a lot of lessons from doing a number of installations and from running tens of thousands of cartons of RFID enabled items
through a, through the system, to get a real feel for real time performance and what happened. That's on the research side. Michael, we'd like to add something. No, yeah, Shelley, that was very well done. And uh, right now we're probably at hundreds of thousands of cartons and uh, tens, tens of millions of items uh, that have been running through the various systems. But yes, uh, it's a very friendly environment out, uh, out here in the RFID world. Uh, customers are willing, to, end users are willing to talk to each other. Uh, various solution providers work in unison, uh, share information. And uh, again, if you're looking for a, a solution provider to spearhead uh, your proof of concept or your pilot, uh, look for someone that has uh, a number of years of experience and a, uh, a fairly substantial install base. Michael, how long have you been in the business? Well, we've been in the business basically uh, a little over 35 years, but uh, an RFID starting with uh, the Center of Excellence in New York uh, in 2002. So that's somewhere around 14 years. Okay. Well, you beat me. I'm, uh, I'm going on nine years, going on 10. But uh, if we Excellent. have a question, please uh, pass them through. Yep. So we got a question. Uh, yeah. Can I just push a button and get my inventory inf information all at once? How about that? Uh, I okay, well, that's actually very uh, a good question. That's a good one. You know what we see? <laughs> we see this a lot. And, 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 and uh, well, so when the, when the question here is, what can you accomplish? Let's set realistic expectations. Okay. The answer is yes. You could do that. You could press a button and instantly get an instant count of your inventory. However, the cost of putting in an infrastructure that would read every single item that's in your four walls in real time would be prohibitive. So what you want to accomplish is to identify the processes that can be RFID enabled and then you know we and other vendors and other solution providers can give you really accurate numbers of in fact you know what what you can accomplish. So the um, that, that's a real basic misunderstanding that uh, I don't know where it came from. Certain um, folks that seem to think that yeah, you know, press a button and boom, get a whole uh, you know an instant little um, uh, picture. What you can do uh, is there's there are ways to even though a, a fixed reader may have four ports or eight ports, uh, there are ways to multiplex and increase the number of antennas, maybe to 32. But even in that situation, um, the the there. The idea is, is, is more to use RFIDs to enhance any of the processes that you have and actually give you better numbers so that when you do, quote unquote, press the button, or more importantly, when you query your inventory system, you'll get numbers that are more accurate than they are now. And that's really the point. Thank you, Phil. So let's move forward. So you've done your, your research. What's, what's that first step? Well, the first step to go when you're ready to write, I'm, Now's the time you have to start spending some money. Okay, what do you need to do? You need a site, excuse me, a site survey. And your site survey, and 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 then those results of the survey are actually put down and in, in, in a document that comes to planning document going forward. Um, so what are you documenting? Well, let's start off before we even get into technical stuff, the real world business processes. And I'm going to give you a an example, and this is why this backwards and forwards here is to remind me. And that is, is that when we have a customer, the customer is uh, it's an asset tracking requirement. And what are they doing? They have certain pallets that are not plain wooden pallets. They're specialized product uh, pallets to, to transport their specialized, um, uh, quite heavy product. And these pallets cost upwards of $200 each. So there was a real business reason for being able to RFID enable the pallets, <coughs> excuse me, and then be able to uh, get a better count of their ability and also to uh, associate them with an order so that they can ask their customers to return those pallets um, in a subsequent transaction. Well, so in, in our discussions with the customer, the assumption was that the forklift operators drove through doorways forwards. Did you think that way, right? 
you know, the forklift lift, lifts up the pallet of goods, and the drive, they drive forward. Well, you know what? <laughs> For some reason, because of the weight or because of the bulkiness of the product, these forklift lift drivers drive backwards. They actually turn around and drive backwards instead of going forward. And um, that, that was an eye-opening experience both for us as the surveyors as well as the customer because the business unit and the RFID champions had no idea that in fact that was the way the material was handled internally. Uh, Michael, I'm going to let you take the uh, next. Where to mount the antennas? Where to mount the, the readers? Thank you, Sheldon. How does the work there? Yeah, typically once you establish processes, and a manual process or a one-to-one -one barcode process is going to change because you're going to take advantage of the batch read capability, the bulk read capability of the RFID technology. So when you're mounting your readers, you need to put them in places where they're not going to be uh, in the way of uh, the normal movement of, of materials, uh, shipments, boxes, cartons, pallets. Uh, there's a fixed portal structure uh, that will mount onto the floor, providing great cross read uh, on items that are low to the ground. Uh, antennas, depending upon the internal process, uh, if we're RFID enabling cartons by identifying the EPCs or the tag within the carton, uh, then we can reduce the amount of antennas and put them in a vertical format and coming in from above. Uh, so, as part of the uh, survey uh, and looking at the processes, number one, how the process is going to change, uh, that will help us identify um, where to mount the uh, the readers, uh, whether above, below, or in a uh, an arch. Yeah, well, thank you, Michael. One, uh, uh, here's a related point on that, and that is is that. Uh, you know, there are certain physical limitations, uh, physics actually, in terms of cable length uh, from, the, from the antenna to the port of the rear, um, but sometimes you, you, you do have to keep in mind, and obviously the, the surveyor will, knows this and will keep in mind, and that is that typically the rear has to be mounted at eye level, so that if there are adjustments to be made you know, from by a technician, he doesn't have to climb over on a ladder to access the reader, it, you know, to get another four feet of of, of cable will not, um, you know, break the the system. But mounting the reader, even though the antenna is going above the door, mounting a reader above the door is a real problem, especially if it's high traffic area and every two minutes somebody's coming through through the door and some and here you've got a technician up on a ladder trying to adjust uh, one of the settings in the reader. So that was kind of the one of the things on the reader. Next, uh, one of the key points is, uh, is the radio interference. And uh, so what we bring when we do site surveys, we bring frequency and analyzers, both a, uh, um, an electronic one and a passive one. It's interesting. It a passive one is an actual signal meter. With the um, electronic ones, I, I, we have a, a, a card, like it's in a laptop, but instead of a card, looking for the the uh, 2.4 gigahertz or the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi bands, it looks in the 900 megahertz band for any uh, EMF, electronic uh, magnetic frequency interference. Okay, it looks for other sources in those wavelengths, and we document that. And um, and then the physical power meter actually will will show the strength of those uh, of that EMF of the cloud in other words so that'll help us you know if some areas need to be shielded but I know Michael has a, a war story that literally this is this is where the scar tissue comes it has to do with ballast but I'm not talking about a submarine take it away oh yeah you must be referring to our friends in Rochester where uh, a site survey was done and the system was installed and uh, it was done during the summertime and as the fall season rolled in with daylight savings time uh, it appeared that when it got dark out the system would stop encoding tags 
rather interesting, uh, but after further uh, uh, review, we found that uh, uh, as the sun went down in the uh, fall daylight savings time, uh, there was a, a vast amount of exterior lighting and the power source for that exterior lighting was in a proximity in the walls in the building of where the RFID encoding was taking place. So we were able to quickly uh, isolate and insulate uh, that power source so that the, uh, when the sun went down, uh, the system would actually continue to function. Thank you. And you reminded me of another uh, example. Well, we were in a uh, major apparel uh, manufacturer, and we had a, uh, we were designing these um, value-added stations, vast stations. And they were along a conveyor, and we were getting readings all over the place. Literally, it's like it was a um, um, an RF hot, one big hotspot, and it didn't make any sense because I mean. Reader, the we hadn't even started turning off, turning on the uh, the the RFID readers yet. It was all this RF energy. Well, it turned out that the conveyor that we were bolting everything to was not properly grounded. And the solution was literally to, you know, sink into the ground, uh, into the floor of the warehouse, the proper grounding strap, and voila! All of a sudden, the problem went away. So, yes. That's why you need a site survey. The other thing that we do in the survey is, you know what, we, we show where you have to bring power, uh, which may be necessary, uh, and in order to do a network. We have uh, moved to a lot in the, in the industry as a number of readers that come out from um, uh, are now POE. Just keep in mind, that's so power over Ethernet, that some of them are are, do not go run at full rated power when on uh, power over Ethernet, okay? Which means that if you need um, a, a lot of coverage, you know, for a very uh, high strength uh, read zone, you may not be able to use P POE with some of the readers. And we'll tell, we can discuss that privately with you if you have this concern. Um, there are newer models that have come out that are full power uh, readers uh, as a matter of fact, the new Alien uh, F800 is a full power reader even with POE. Okay? So, well, what's going to happen now is you're going to get this report. You're going to get this document from, the, uh, uh, from your surveyor, and they'll say, they'll give you exactly how many readers you need, how many antennas you need, and now you begin to, you, you can actually prepare a budget, because now you actually know well, what, what, what are we talking about. Okay, let me show you uh, some of the stuff that you, you know. The this is uh, the actual floor plan. It's marked where things will go. Different alternative views are shown and how to tag them. Detail, literally down to you under this tile, we can put a reader, etc. And so forth, or where on a conveyor to mount antennas, etc. And so forth. This is the you get this with these. The survey document will give you a very well, specific instruction, and uh, is, there are you know one of the things that you keep in mind is that the survey team uh, gives you a document that you can then prepare an RF uh, you know queue. They, they it's not mutually exclusive. In other words, it doesn't have to be done by the same vendor, but don't expect the vendor to do it for nothing. Because your solution provider, it's a really independent thing, and uh, and we recommend keeping it as such. Okay. So what happens now, so now you have an idea, you can begin to, 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 put, to put the numbers. Now the next decision is, will it work? Or as they say in the old YouTube days, the earliest days of YouTube virability, will it blend? Okay, you choose products to test. Maybe you've got one product type. Maybe you have multiple product types that you need to test, okay? Um, and also you're probably going to be testing different tag types. Now, if it's a compliance um, issue, for, let's say with an electronic product code, EPC compliance, the, your uh, retail partner will tell you there's a tag grade to use, and they'll specify the tags that they want 
for each of the of the uh, of the clothing types, for example. Um, but whatever the product is, whether it's soap, whatever paper, because you have to make that decision about which products you want to test with, and then you get them to a test lab. What you'll have to do first, though, is <laughs> because you have nothing you have is RFID tag, you'll get your um, tag vendor will supply you with um, you know, nice sample quantity, 150, 200 tags of each type. Then you, in a, in a, inside your warehouse, you have to open up your existing cartons and attach these tags uh, to your existing tickets, so to the bags or whatever, however else you're packaging. Okay, and then you seal them back up and you send them to a testing center. Uh, we recommend at least five cartons um, of each skew and at least five cartons of each tag type. So you could be sending 25, 30 cartons to, to, this, to this lab. What happens is we give you like real numbers, and uh, which then now, you, you know, again, now you go the next step further. So the first outlay is to do the site survey. You get the document. Then the second outlay is to send your product to a, a testing center. Let me go through a little bit of detail about the testing. All right. These are actual real, real read rates, not even samples. Okay, this is an hour um, experience. What we're getting now, okay? Footwear, ninety-nine point seven percent. You can see the they're really very high up there. Um, you know, jeans, ninety-nine percent. The the only one that's a little lower is bras. Why? Because the underwires can affect performance because it's made out of metal. Here's a, another war story. We actually got samples of a cart. Now we've been doing this for a while, so we're we know that certain product types we're gonna you know should be getting stuff right away up in the 90s, and then we tune equipment to get to these these super high numbers. And I don't know what was it 40, 50 percent. We were getting terrible read ranges, and we were saying I can't understand. We know the tags, we know the vendor. What is different? Well, it turned out that this particular product was a new line. And because the marketing folks have, you know, marketing and sales has more sway than anybody in a, in a business. So they, uh, de they decreed that the packaging for this product had to have a metallic foil, you know, foil printing. Well, the foil printing was shielding the, the RFID tags. And uh, so the thing goes, well, that's, one, at least that's, that's what the testing's for. We were able to identify that something was, was really wrong with that. Sheldon, and also just to make note, uh, as we move forward, most of the major retailers have tested most of the products that will be going through the supply chain today. So if you're working with Macy's, if you're working with Saks, Nordstrom's, Lord & Taylor, they will give you a list of the proper inlays to use based upon your product type. So a lot of this work has been done for you already. Uh, it'll be the performance of those tags uh, in the real world environment, when you start moving them at high speed, right. So that's where you know what what our this is our test methodology. Uh, first, we just say, hey, can we read what's in the box <laughs> without doing without any movement and without other cartons um, giving us any uh, you know stray reads. Next is semi-automatic. It's in motion. Uh, we also you know run different readers if there see if there's any variability on that different antennas, um, and then and then we do that on a roller conveyor. And then the next uh, step is put it on our high-speed conveyor and literally let it roll, and it's a racetrack, and we let it run for hours. I mean, we want to get hundreds of, of, of runs of these cartons, okay, so that we can really fine-tune. I'll show you the next slide, you'll see. Uh, the left is the, uh, the, is the, is the roller, uh, I mean, this is the static. If the box is not moving, can we read it? The next is the um, on a roller conveyor where, where we can slide the three uh, uh, cartons back and forth. We actually put spacers in between that match your gap for your material handling equipment, and we we start to get a feel for what what, what are we getting there. And then we we go to the next step, and the next step is this is our uh, lab in West Seneca, New York. That's Mike Chabet. We're doing a test there on customers' cartons. That conveyor can go, what is it, 350, 400 feet a minute. And we uh, basically 
run your product and see what kind of results we can get. And uh, Michael, well, you you're, you have a better feel. Tell me, what kind of results do we get based on the with a combination of speed, distance, carton content? Actually, in the lab that we had set up using the uh, uh, the Edge Magic application where we were running about 400 feet per minute, 18 inches of carton separation with 100% validation. There you go. So to meet your requirements, that's, if you're telling us that you have a 600 feet per minute conveyor and you want 18 inches of separation, we can tell you right now it's not going to work. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> we can tell you, well, here, this is what you need to sep uh, separate to get the simulation for our uh, and we'll show you a little bit more here. So now you've got the test and analysis. You've uh, actually got the, uh, the resulting data, okay? It's the, what we're trying to do is determine the probability of success in your situation. Basically, once it's run through our racetrack, we take that cage, we can drop it right over your racetrack, and if you've got tagged goods, you should get the same results that we're getting here in the lab. Because once you're assured that RFID will perform in your environment and with your products, you're ready to pilot the solution. So what are the steps to pilot and refine? Start with just picking one area. Whether it's picking, whether it's receiving, whether it's shipping, just pick one and pick one line. Okay. Um, Next, don't don't go up to the degree of having to, to completely mount stuff with uh, you know drilling into walls and so on. Temporary mounted. You, you could even use a photo tripod for, for an antenna. The quarter inch screw is easy enough to use and start to get some some data there. Um, you need to build a temporary portal. Use PVC pipe. To, to put some uh, brackets to hold readers over a conveyor or over a dock door. This way, the you know I want got to keep the you know we understand keeping the expense as low as part of the pilot. More importantly, not, you don't want anything locked down. You really need to be able to completely move things around if necessary because you'll discover things in the pilot. And we, without question, this is no place for hard code. You want to have a so software that allows you to go in or let the vendor can go in and you know, change sessions, change antenna power, um, uh, various functions, et cetera, and so forth. But uh, you, you can't hard code. It makes no sense to hard code just because you're saying, well, it's only a pilot, so I'm going to hard code it. No, you want to actually be able to change the parameters pretty much on the fly until you find a set that's really performing like you want. And then, and then you, you'll be, you, then you move forward. Now, there's a. I see a question here. Uh, the gentleman is asking, well, can you use a handheld for a pilot? Um, I guess he's saying as opposed to a fixed reader, because that looks like what we're talking about. Uh, Michael, you want to take that? Absolutely. Yes, you can use a handheld for a pilot, and that'll give you uh, some instantaneous results. A handheld will provide a lot of flexibility. Not only can you uh, uh, receive shipments uh, and have some user interaction with the system uh, responding to any of uh, uh, adjustments, if you will, to make sure you get a fully consistent read. Uh, the handheld will also provide some C confine capabilities, some cycle count capabilities, uh, so it provides you a lot more uh, features and functions. Now, when we want to take the human equation out of the process and automate the process, that's when we want to put the fixed infrastructure in place. And that's where we put in uh, some temporary staging, set up some specific antennas, and then configure those antennas in the reader uh, using the flexible software. Once we have that dialed in, and we have uh, autonomously getting accurate reads without human intervention, uh, we can then mount the uh, fixed portals and harden the solution uh, for long-term use. Thank you, Michael.
so then uh, the question is, well, how long should you pilot RFID? <laughs> Just run it as long as you need to to run the pilot. Uh, for each, as long as you need to, to gather enough data for each application area. Whichever one you use, receiving, picking, shipping, and you can have multiple little pilots going. I mean, just you know, you know, each one has to have its own uh, measurable performance. Um, once you determine that each of them have, do stand on their own with the data that you're getting based on the refinement, then you, now you can say, okay, let's 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 roll out, let's go into production. So the pilot can be as short as six weeks and as you know six months. It really depends on uh, you know more of, of, of your business. So it's not a, a a short answer. One of the tools that we use in uh, that's available so to Edge Magic customers is the Tag Vendor Scorecard, and I will let Michael explain the beauty of this tool. Thank you, Sheldon. You know, the vendor scorecard just happens to be a, uh, a result of the data. Uh, it, during the validation process, uh, during the receiving process, once we've hardened the system and we're receiving tens of thousands of cartons, millions of items, uh, during that process we're validating whether the cartons are complete. We're looking at cartons to see uh, if there are assortment packs, if the proper assortment is in place in a one two three three two one format, or whatever the criteria is, but during that validation process, we're also capturing uh, performance criteria of each and every RFID tag in each and every carton. And what we're able to do, since we know the source of the carton uh, by country, by region. Uh, we know the source of the tag by vendor, by particular factory. Uh, we're now able to generate a report that will show uh, particular tags from a particular vendor in a particular region have uh, wide performance characteristics. They're either uh, not waking up, uh, they have some frequency fluctuation problems, or they've got some other issues where they're uh, uh, being they're, they're performing beyond their uh, uh, effective range, so very quickly we can get, and this is this is very important for a lot of folks that uh, are in a compliance mode, uh, uh, and they're buying uh, RFID tags because they're mandated to as a price ticket. Uh, you now have a tool where you can go back and number one capture any particular tags that might have potential problems, either in terms of the uh, serial number, the encoding, uh, the performance, uh, capture those on inbound before they get any deeper into the supply chain, and also have a report where you could go back to your vendors and negotiate um, any type of uh, consideration uh, based upon the performance of those tags. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about rollout of production. Now you're at that uh, five steps. So as you see, we've, it's a very deliberate process we went through. We've really um, we've, we've done the research and the scope. So you've just, you know talked to a lot of vendors. You 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 you've looked at what's out there. You've had a site survey that documented what's required to do. You've tested, had goods tested and analyzed real-world uh, uh, capabilities, material handling, just like what you've got in your facility. Uh, you piloted it, and you've got a field. So, so now you can replicate. You replicate the result of the pilot. So what's going to be determined, granted, the number one thing is geographic. depends on how many facilities you need to, uh, um, to implement. Hardware will make a difference. We'll talk a little bit about that. Software will make a huge difference, which we'll talk about a little bit. But the other thing is internal resources. Do you have the people that you'll need you know, to uh, be an r champion can be one place at one time, but then again, depending on the sort of implementation that you're doing, then the RFID champion may have to go on a road trip and uh, meet the installers at each location, or you're going to actually use your internal facilities people. There's plenty of ways to, uh, to work with it. Uh, we have... Um, you know, installation organizations that we work with who 
I like to call them wire jockeys. But these guys, you know, that's all they do is climb on ceilings and uh, and and string uh, cable and, and make uh, insulation. So that that you work out with with the vendor. Um, but let's talk about some of the options here. Okay, when you remember in the we to keep the cost down for that pilot. The recommendation was to yeah you know use a use a photo tripod for an antenna or you know build something out of PVC pipe that you got at Home Depot. That's like okay, but that's not permanent. And the reason why you want a permanent is well, obviously for robustness, but this is the second reason. Uh, on a portal, um, a permanent off-the-shelf portal, number one, because it's off-the-shelf, meaning that it's not something that was customized, raised by some welder in a backyard, is that, you know what, you need 30, you can order 30 and they'll be delivered. That's number one. Number two, it's a standard product that's been engineered to accept readers from any manufacturer, antennas from any manufacturer. More importantly, if it's made quality out of powder gauge steel, etc., so powder coated, you know, uh, steel, is that the ROI, the lifetime of the portal, could be 30 years. The the, the lifetime of the mounting hardware, 30 years. Even though I can guarantee you, within those 30 years, you will have swapped out the readers from later generations, better performing, and even antennas over that time. So that to get that permanent a uh, proper portal and, or conveyor mounts, et cetera, and so forth, a cage, that is a, a critical uh, decision to make. It's not, you know, no, the PVC pipe will not work. You will want to invest in ballards to prevent your forklift drivers from smashing into your RFID hardware. This is just fact of life, but more importantly, to do it right. Um, and next, the software. What our software allows you to do is you, the champion, you can you can be on site. You can be in a in a remote site. You you've got the the console, so to speak. You've got the con. You can you know add, add the read zone as it's as it's being uh, wired up, and you add your antennas. And more importantly, you can actually watch the system come to life on the screen because the software. You don't need to bring in you know IT person every time you need to do something. And this is, makes it really easy to roll it out. As a matter of fact. We make it so easy that you can take an existing reader definition, just copy it, change the IP address, and boom, it's 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 enabled. Same thing with antennas. So, so we, I mean, I've rolled out, you know, done an installation where I did close to 20 readers and associated antennas in a day, and what, and most of those seven hours was me in the ceiling running the antennas, not doing the software side. So having a proper software will really help. Let's show some pictures here. Uh, so here's a um, portals from uh, a Jameson RFID. Uh, this is a reader cabinet. Got an uh, uh, antenna cabinet. They've got some additional antennas on the top, and uh, what? And it's got this ray dome cover. And uh, they see there you've got some ballards. Um, this thing is not going anywhere, and you'll be able to change and go forward. Here's our cyber RFID cage. Uh, this is actually in pilot mode, where we uh, had this, the hardware mounted on this board. Now that's included in a, in a NEMA enclosure when we go uh, formal. Um, and uh, and here's our um, Edge Magic Edge Box controller, which is a server that can be you know uh, dropped in to uh, fanless, it's no moving parts. It can. We install it inside an NEMA enclosure, and, 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 and you're ready to go. And so here, now the word from our sponsor, and that is that uh, uh, Edmagic gives you all the tools that you need to quickly and easily uh, uh, roll out with the mobile support, uh, the dashboards, as well as a very uh, straightforward, intuitive configuration capabilities. Michael, do you want to add anything to that? No, Sheldon, that was pretty complete. As you can see, we're running in different uh, uh, operating systems, OSs, if you will, Android, uh, iOS, uh, mixing, the, mixing the many together uh, to facilitate an easy rollout. So what, can, what do you hope to 
accomplish what's the future if you follow the plan? These are the numbers. They're not our numbers, although we have seen these numbers too. Don't take our word for it. Take it from the GS1 and from the University of Auburn University RFID lab. You'll see an 80% improvement in shipping and picking accuracy. You see 90% improvement in receiving time. And actually, we we doing we're doing things at certain customers that were physically impossible to do without RFID in the past. So there's no comparison. You can't compare. I'll just give you one. We uh, at one customer, we're uh, doing a complete inventory count twice a day. Well, they could never do that if they were scanning barcodes. Okay. And uh, bottom line, I'm having a 20% improvement in item of vis uh, visibility and availability. Well, that you know what? That's going to hit the hit your bottom line, you know, straight there. So really, we thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Mike and I will be available at these following shows. Actually, we will we will be both be at RFID Journal Live in Orlando coming up next month, and actually at the, the GS1 uh, conference uh, in June. And uh, if there's any questions, oh, I see some. Bill, would you like to? Uh... Absolutely. Yep. I think this is probably the one question that a lot of people would like to hear. It's pretty direct. Can you give a minimum budget for determining if we should move forward with RFID? All right. Well, I'm Michael, I'm going to toss the ball to you. You're in the sales department. <laughs> Thank you, Sheldon. Yeah, typically when putting together a comprehensive proof of concept or pilot. Now, a lot of pilots and proof of concepts have already been completed. Uh, really, the technology has evolved beyond just a simple proof of concept. It's almost uh, at this point, you're implementing a full phase one. So when you're implementing a full phase one, you want to put the proper APIs in place and you want to link to the data, the source data. So whether it be coming from CGS Blue Cherry, Oracle, Infor, Manhattan Associates, put those links in place and start capturing that data. And then this way you'll be able to get the full benefit of RFID. As you get those links in place, uh, you'll need a little bit of hardware infrastructure, uh, some uh, the proper software on the server. So realistically, uh, you should anticipate uh, something a little less than say $50,000 will allow you to put together a very comprehensive phase one that will produce a return on investment and will produce some value upon its implementation. Very good. The, the, the ROI is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, we are uh, reducing chargebacks on, um, you know, miss, uh, on, on missed shipments. That's a, that's a big one right off the bat, uh, right off the bat, or uh, you know, undercount, um, just uh, mistakes in, in in packing and shipping. Uh, those those chargebacks from your from your partners, from your customers, uh, that typically can pay for the system in uh, in short order. Just, just on, Actually, on that alone. I, Kelly, as we speak right now, there is an article in the RFID Journal magazine on RFIDJournalLive.com where you can look up uh, the Cybra Cage article uh, that was published this week and it provides a number of uh, use case scenarios and a few ROI points on where you can actually uh, use RFID above and beyond the typical carton validation. Very good, thank you. Phil, any other questions? Sure. This one's a little generic, but um, maybe that could you know tie up some loose ends. Uh, what other operation, major operational changes are required to implement an RFID system? Well, uh, I'll give my little two cents, and then uh, I will. Well, I'm sure Michael will have some some more of the, uh, stories from the trenches. And that is is that oh, well, one of the things that that. You have to keep, you really look at it in an open mind because there are certain capabilities that you didn't have before. So, for example, there, are, there, there is a reason for 
all of our attendees, uh, every retail brand owner for sure, to audit their inbound cartons. They, they take N percent, whatever it is, whether it's 10 percent or 3 percent, whatever the number is that's good for them internally, or they literally have to open up the carton and look inside to see what the fact that the order is complete, is, is, is correct, at least based on what the ASM says, based on their purchase order uh, to the factory. So when, um, with, but now with RFID, well, gee, you know, we have the capability to run the, a real-time audit of every single carton, of every single item on every single carton. Well, does that mean you don't have to stop the audit? Well, maybe this way. You know, you'll still have to do audits, but maybe for different purposes. Maybe less of a percentage because uh, the RFID is telling you if the items are correct, et so if, if the hanger color is correct or if the, you know, there may be, there's lots of other little details that um, those folks at, the, uh, uh, at, your, at your retail partners can, can make it hard for you, but um, that's, that's like a change. Um, or in, uh, in another example uh, where we're actually doing a complete cycle count of the inventory at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, um, well, we're doing something that they were never able to do before, but it does still take time <laughs> to do it. So the operator what, you know, needs to know or you know, has that, you know, yes, for the first eight minutes of your day, you're not, you can't be at your desk because you're actually running this, this process. It's a very important process. It's allowing you to get the entire inventory, but um, it, it's a, it is a change. Michael, any others? Yeah, see, another one which typically happens in the logistics process in the DC. Uh, as you're bringing cartons in and you're validating the carton against the purchase order or the ASN, you're capturing the EPCs or the RFID tags in, in, in each carton. So in essence, what you have done is you've now RFID enabled a barcoded carton. So no longer do you have to treat that carton, singulate that carton, to be able to read every, uh, every LPN no number, if you will, on every carton during a cycle count or an inventory in the DC or during the pick pack process. Um, now that you know what's inside the carton is RFID tagged, all you have to do is see one RFID tag, you know you have the carton. Until that carton is pulled from active uh, uh, from bulk inventory, uh, to an active pick area where the carton is broken uh, uh, for store replenishment. But what you've basically done in the process of, uh, of validation and, and, and uh, checking the uh, RFID tags coming in is that you've literally RFID enabled a barcoded carton and now can take advantage of that fact in the supply chain. Thank you, Michael. I believe uh, we've come to the end of our of our hour. Is there any other questions, Phil? Uh, there are. Do you want to do any more? I know we're, we're pretty close to the end here. Um, yeah, 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 we're pretty close. Again. I have a hard stop at, uh, at 3, but I think I have a, a, may have some more. Take your pick, Phil. Uh, tell me what you got. All right. Um, I, would like to know, I would like to know more about your APIs and ways to integrate with other softwares. Okay. Well, that, that's actually documented uh, in the software, but we also uh, can point you to a web link that has the documentation of the, the RESTful API for EdgeMagic. Okay. Actually, and just to expand on that a little bit, Sheldon, is the companies like Oracle, companies like Manhattan Associates, companies like CGS Blue Cherry uh, already have relationships with uh, Cyber and EdgeMagic and those interfaces are already in place, so all you have to do now is use them. Very good. And uh, I believe it's time. Okay, we'll, we will um, contact the uh, additional question, uh, whole, uh, whole question answer questioners directly. Uh, this week, Michael will be in touch. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, hopefully you've learned a bit, and we look forward to uh, meeting you if you can see us at these conferences. If you have any questions, please write to 
sales or info at cyber.com um, and or call us up at 1-800-CYBRA-88 and uh, we look forward to answering any further questions that you may have. Thanks for joining us and have a great day everybody. Thank you so much.